Gracious Heavenly Father, we are here again this evening, very grateful for your faithfulness to us. We ask that we will be made faithful by your faithfulness. We also ask that your Holy Spirit will be given to us this evening in great measure, that we will be able to listen carefully, to understand, to receive what you are trying to tell us, and to receive it with joy, allowing you, letting you work in us your pleasure, your truth, and prepare us for the day of your coming. We also pray for those that will be watching the videos later on. May they have as well the blessing of your Holy Spirit to guide and enlighten their minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we go into the memory verses, and the very first one is from Matthew 1, 21. And now let me see, it is, oh, it is the second, second half. So we need to begin with 1 Timothy 2, 5 instead. For there is one God and one mediator between men and between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Habakkuk 2, 4. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The faith of Jesus, right? Very good. Exodus 12, 13, about the blood, and the blood shall be to you for a token, or a sign, or a proof, right? Upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when i smite the land of egypt this happened at the 10th plague and they had to put the blood there on the frame of their doors right all right the next one is from exodus 28 to 11 and that will go right with our lesson that we started last last uh, week so remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor, not, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. All right. Romans 5, 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but when where sin abounded grace did much more abound that a sin sin hath reigned unto death even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by jesus christ our lord so many of the blessings that we receive well all of them do but as we read in the bible especially in the new testament most everything ends in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, everything comes through him. All right, and the very last one that we added last week, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed one more time but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed isaiah 53 verse 5 all right, I guess we are then set and ready to go into the chapter. We are in ch on chapter 30, and we got all the way to page 153 last time. There is a food no note that is 
one, two, three, four, and the fifth line from the top on page 153 is in the second commandment, and it's in relationship to the word generation. The notice at the bottom of the page, of course, and let's just read there that they are making they are making sure that we do not get caught up with a thought which is a not the correct thought because what it's doing is twisting God's character and God's love and kindness to us and making him appear more than a monster. So at the bottom of page 153. The note number 10. There is in the Hebrew text of this passage no word indicating generation, not in the place where we find the, the call, uh, that little number 10. In that one, in the Hebrew, there is no word generation, but that was supplied, supplied by the translators. Why? If you have ever done any translation, you will you will probably understand a little bit of why sometimes you just have to do that because in the other language, things work in a little different way, meanings are transferred in a in a different manner, and so you have to do the best to keep the meaning of it, sometimes just adjusting or repeating or um, changing things around. Anyway, so let's continue. It is most evident, however, that it is the word required by the sense, and attention is called to it only to point out the fact that the construction is the same as in the next clause. What is the next clause? Where it says, uh, fourth generation of them uh, that hate me. I'm sorry. The first time, uh, the fathers, yeah, for generation of them that hate me and showing mercy on 2000 of them. So that them there, there is where it is the, the problem where people then make up their own minds about a, a different conclusion altogether. Okay. So the construction is the same as in the next clause where the word generation is not expressed. We just find a pronoun, right? Them. But there it belongs as surely as in the first. Some have hastily supposed that the thousands, thousands of them, refers only to individuals. And so have erroneously concluded that God's, God's chastisement outlast his mercy. Not so. Not so at all, right? In other words, they're saying, oh yeah, he just, he, he is, he just, he just punishes everybody, but his goodness is only to a few. See, in other words, they are turning God like a, what do you call these things that have a big part at the top and a little part at the bottom? Um, uh, right now, I'm just thinking of it in Spanish. <laughs> so, Santa Rosa, a funnel. Yes, a funnel. Thank you a very funnel. much. Yes, okay. a funnel. So think of God. God is full of mercy, but they are turning him around and saying, no, his, his mercy is very little and his punishment is very large. It's the other way around. It says, and let's read again, for I, the Lord thy God, I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children upon the th unto the third and fourth generation so whatever the effects not that he is punishing the children for something that the parents did no this is just the natural consequences that pass on in the genes and through behavioral learning and through habits and all of those things so he's saying, hey, watch out, because what you do, the choices that you make and the habits that you partake of will pass on. And he says, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. Now, there is less in a third and fourth generation than they are when it says thousands, not a thousand, but thousands. So his mercy is always greater. Well, we just got done repeating Matthew, I mean, uh, Romans 5.20, where it said that where sin abounded, what did he do? His grace abounded 
even more. That is the true character of God. And to make this the other way around as they are doing, as some of them are coming to interpret it, it just makes God with the wrong character. They are just giving him a, a black eye. Continue. He visits the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate him but shows mercy unto unnumbered thousands of generations of them that love him and keep his commandments. His wrath is soon appeased, while his mercy flows unto eternity. Other versions than the English state it very plainly. Um, even when those things are passed on, you know, like uh, people that have been on, on cocaine or uh, drinkers and so on and so forth, pass on weaknesses to their children and grandchildren and so forth. Even though that is true, if it wasn't for God that heals and repairs and that his grace is there to guide us, how many of us will be able able even to get out from our beds with the generations and generations and thousands and thousands of them all of them sinning and doing all kinds of terrible things to our genes only because of the mercies of god and let's remember that his mercies are always greater than the results of sin all right um we were studying about what god spoke that was the section we were in and we read the ten commandments Let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus 20, verse 2. Exodus 20, verse 2. That's where the commandments are. And I want us to, to think again, and there will be more on the, on the rest of the lesson here, about the way that God spoke those commandments. Exodus 20, verse 2, we have, I am thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. We could call that the preamble to his constitution. He is saying, look, what I'm about to tell you here is on the basis of this. I am the Lord that brought you out. It's not somebody else that's coming now to tell you, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not worship this, thou shalt not do the other, and um, be careful with that. No, it is the same God. I am the Lord thy God that brought you out from the house of bondage. And as much as he said it in those terms, to the people of Israel, to all of us, even though we might have never been slaves, in any plantation or to anybody, we need to remember that he is still, God is still our Lord, our God, who have brought us out of the land of Egypt, the land of evil, of our own evil nature. He has, he has saved us, right? Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin and from the house of bondage. We, I don't think um, human the human race has known a greater bondage than the bondage that we are all subject to, the bondage to sin. And that is the greatest liberation that the human race would have experienced as well. So on the basis of that, on the, on the basis of what is said in verse 2, then verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and on and on and on, God is saying, look, on the basis that I have done already this work, the greater work, trust me, I am able to keep on working now, not just to get you out from slavery out of Egypt, but I am willing and I have the power and I have the love for you enough to do in you what you can do for yourself and to do in you what will prepare you so that you and I can live together forever. With that in mind, then let's go to page 153 and we'll continue from the paragraph that's after the commandments there. <clears throat> this is the law that was uttered amid the terrors of Sinai by the lips of him whose life it was and is, and from who, whom had come the stream which was at the moment flowing, his own life giving for the people, given for the people. The cross, and please underline these next two lines, the cross with its healing, life-giving stream 
was at Sinai and hence the cross. It cannot possibly make any change in the law. The life proceeding from Christ at Sinai as at Calvary shows that the righteousness which is revealed in the gospel is none other than that of the Ten Commandments. Not one jot or one tittle could pass away. The awfulness of Sinai was at Calvary in the thick darkness, the earthquake and the great voice of the Son of God. The smitten rock and the flowing stream at Sinai represented Calvary. Calvary was there so that it is an actual fact that from Calvary, the Ten Commandments are proclaimed in the identical words that were heard from Sinai. Please underline the next two and a half lines. Let's read together. Calvary, not less than Sinai, reveals the terrible and unchanging holiness of the law of God. So terrible and so unchangeable that it spared not even the Son of God when, quote, he was reckoned among the transgressors. But however great the terror inspired by the law, the hope by grace is even greater. Yes, we know that already too. For where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Back again now to, to underlining the next three and a half. Back of all stands the oath of God's covenant of grace, assuring the perfect righteousness and life of the law in Christ. So that although the law spoke death, it only showed what great things God has promised to do for those who believe. That is why we say, and we are saying that based on what the preamble and everything else tells us there, what we call the Ten Commandments are not ten orders. They are ten promises. That is what God covenants with us, promises us, as he promised to Abraham, promises to do in us and for us. Finishing that paragraph there on 154, it teaches us to have no confidence in, in the flesh, but to do what instead? To worship God in the spirit and to rejoice in Christ Jesus. Thus God was proving his people that they might know that, quote, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, doth man live. That's from Deuteronomy 8.3. Before we go on, I would like to also um, point out that on the third line where it quotes, he was reckoned among the transgressors. If you want to, that comes from Luke 22.37. And then Please open your Bibles to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. So this will be in the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to hear the words of Jesus speaking about what we were just reading here. <clears throat> Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. This is um, in reference to on page 153, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Seven. On, on the sixth and seventh lines of that paragraph that we just read, it says that not one jot or one tittle could pass away from the law. In other words, nothing can change it. The, the commandments didn't change it. The cross didn't change it. Nothing changes the law of God. And let's hear what Jesus says himself from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. It says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that means to, to obey it to the full, to the fullest, okay? Verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, 
till all be fulfilled. So Jesus himself, I'm sure, knowing what was coming and how we were going to try to misinterpret and the, how much the enemy would like to, to make us believe, oh, you know what, the law of God, no, that, that's Old Testament thing. That was there for the Jews. They were saved by, by obeying the law. No, if anybody could have ever been saved by obeying the law on their own, Jesus would have come for absolutely nothing, completely in vain. So that thought itself is, is foolishness. Uh, the, the people in the Old Testament could not have kept the Ten Commandments any better than we could if we tried on our own. But they could and we can allow God to do it in us. And it's just the right way to do it, right? He will fulfill that promise for us. All right, let's go now to the last paragraph on page 154. The whole paragraph is worth underlining. So the law is not against the promises of God, even though it cannot give life, right? The law cannot give life. On the contrary, it backs up those promises in thunder tones. For with God's oath, Ever steadfast, the greatest requirement of the law is to the ear of faith, but a promise of its fulfillment. And so, taught by the Lord Jesus, we may, quote, know that his commandment is life everlasting. And that is from John 12, 50. All right, we are ready then to enter into chapter 31, the title of which is The Promises to Israel, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. So we just finished Mount Sinai and Mount Calvary. Now, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Well, let's see what it has to say about that. This was an article written for the present truth of December 3, 1896 begins by quoting from Psalms 48, 1 to 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. So right away, do you catch there? The, the city of our God is where? Is Mount Zion, okay? On the sides of the north, the city of the great king, there it is again, God is known in her palaces for a refuge. Psalms 48, 1, 2, 3. Second paragraph, these words are sung in praise of the dwelling place of God in heaven. For, quote, the Lord is in his holy temple to the Lord's throne. I'm sorry, the Lord's throne is in heaven. Psalm 11, 4. And of Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of, of the majesty in heavens, according to Hebrews 8, 1, the Lord says, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, or upon Zion, the hill of my holiness, Psalms 2, 6. Jesus Christ, the anointed king in Zion is high priest as well, a priest forever, we have read this before, after the order of, order of Melchizedek. The Lord has said of the man whose name is the branch, that, quote, he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. So, as he sits upon his father's throne in the heavens, he is, quote, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So, this is a different sanctuary that we have studied before, right? The sanctuary in the desert, and the, which is also the, the temple 
um, became a temple and once they got to the land of Canaan, that was pitched by people. They made the materials, they made the, all the, the um, coverings and the, the um, furniture and all of that, but the one in heaven is pitched by God, not by man, from Hebrews 8 to. It was to this place, we have talked about this also before, to Mount Zion, the hill of God's holiness, and to the sanctuary upon it, his dwelling place, that God was leading his people Israel when he delivered them from Egypt. When they had safely passed through the Red Sea, Moses sang these inspired words, quote, thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Exodus 15, 17. But they did not get to Mount Zion because they did not quote, hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. That is from Hebrews 3, 6. So, quote, we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. That is also in Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 6. Yet God did not forsake them. For even, quote, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. And that is from 2 Timothy 2.13. So he instructed Moses to tell the people to bring offerings of gold and silver and precious stones together with other material. Page 156. And said, what did he say? Everybody together? Let them Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And continues, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. This was not the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, but one made by man. The tabernacle and its furniture were only the pattern of things in the heavens and not the heavenly things themselves, according to Hebrews 9.23. It was but a shadow of the real substance. The cause of the shadow will be considered later, but the believing ones of the olden times knew as well as Stephen, as Stephen did in late, later years, that Quote, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you built unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Acts 7, 48 and 49. So those were words that Stephen spoke before being stoned. <clears throat> Solomon, at the dedication of his grand temple, said, But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built? 2 Chronicles 6, 18. This next paragraph, please mark, make a star, put an arrow. All of God's really faithful children understood that the earthly tabernacle or temple was not the real dwelling place of God, but only a figure or type. So of the furniture, which the sanctuary contained. And now I would like us to take a very quick look at that tabernacle. If you want to review from the past course that we did, or if you want to learn for the first time, you may go to the videos um, for heralding the loud cry. And if you have the, the uh, previous invitations and so forth, you will have there the, um, the links for those. If you need them, please ask Janet or ask me. We will be more than glad to, to give them to you. Videos 36, 
pardon me, 38 through 56, beginning with October 18 of 2021. Okay, those are the ones that deal with the sanctuary. For now, let's do a little bit of a, of a short presentation on this. The sanctuary and God's throne. We repeat it already from Exodus 25, day eight, how God requested that Moses tell the people of Israel to make me, he said, a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Here we have a representation, not necessarily a picture because there were no pictures taken at that time, but what somebody imagines as this looked like. And there it is, the sanctuary is right in the middle of the encampment. All the people are encamped around it. This was the center of their nation, the center of their town, the center of their society, the center of their finances, everything. The, the, the sanctuary, and the economy of God were the rule and the ruler. Here we see the presence of God, a pillar of fire. Another view from the daytime. And so you can see here the, the outer court is all curtained off. There's only one place of entrance and the, the, the tent is the sanctuary itself but the outside also counts as a third part we will see in a little bit here here we are we have the three parts of the sanctuary the outer court which is where the altar of sacrifice and the laver are and then there is a curtain for entrance into the holy place that has three pieces of furniture the candelabra the the table of the showbread and the incense, the altar of incense right there, right in front of the veil that divides these two compartments. And so behind that veil is the most holy place. In the most holy place, there was only one piece of furniture and that is the Ark of the Covenant. Here's another view of it. Of just of the two compartments of the tent of the sanctuary, the holy place here, and the most holy place behind the curtain. In the holy place, the priests, the Levites, the high priest entered daily and did the, the presentation of the, of the um, blood and the sacrifices, the blood of the sacrifices and the sacrifices into the second compartment, the most holy place, only once a year, the high priest entered on the day of atonement. In that compartment, like we said, in the most holy place, there was only one piece of furniture. And here we have a representation of it. It was a, a solid box made of gold, um, no, was made of wood and it was plated with gold outside and inside. The top though, the lid, this part here at the top, that was of solid gold and it had two angels facing one another and with the tips of the wings touching. That represents the throne of God. One more view here. Here it is the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat. That's what you see here at the top. The lid of the box is called the mercy seat. That's, that's the one that has the angels on it. And inside the box, these were the items that were placed there and kept there. A pot of manna. Aaron's rod and the two tables of the Ten Commandments. They were stored in this box. The box was called the Ark of the Covenant or, and we will talk a little bit more about that, the Ark of the Testimony. The tables of stone that were kept there were the ones that contained the Ten Commandments and they were written 
by the finger of God. The first of the tables contain the first four commandments, which are or describe the relationship between us and God. Is He is the only God, not uh, the second commandment, not making idols or bowing them to them, bowing ourselves to them. The third one, not taking his name in vain. And the fourth one, remember the Sabbath day and he's the creator. He made the Sabbath holy. And then the second table is the relationship between us humans, our, our responsibilities to our fellow men. Honor your father, your mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. All right, now that we have looked at that, then let's go back to the book and let's read the paragraph after the one that you just underlined. As God's throne is in his holy temple in heaven, so in the temple of, in the type of that temple on earth, there was a representation of his throne. A very feeble representation, it is true, as much inferior to the real as the works of man are inferior to those of God. Yet a figure of it, nevertheless. That figure of God's throne was the ark, which contained the tables of the law. A few texts of scripture will show this. From Exodus 25, 10 to, 24, 10 to 22, it contains the complete description of the ark. And I, I encourage you to please go back and read that. Exodus 25, 10 to 22. Make yourself a, a little note there or something so that you go back. It will fit and sit in your mind much better once the more you allow your mind to think about it, to imagine it, to listen to the words and everything else, okay? It was a box made of wood, but completely covered within and without with fine gold. Into this ark, the Lord directed to put the testimony which he should give him. This Moses did, for afterward, in recounting to Israel the circumstances of the giving of the law together with their idolatry, which led to the breaking of the first tables, he said. Now, before we go to what it is that he recounted, I want us to take a little detour here. Please open your Bibles to Exodus 32, 15 and 16. It's in regards to the testimony there, Exodus 32, 15 and 16. 32, 15 and 16. Let's see what it is that, that is talking about here. 15, and Moses turned and went down from the mount and the two tables of the testimony Two tables, as we have looked at it, right? The tables of stone where God wrote the Ten Commandments. The two tables of the testimony, that's what they are called here, were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And now... Please turn to Exodus 25, verse 22. Exodus 25, verse 22. So this is part of that reading that you would like to please do. The last verse that they encourage us to study, it says there, and there I will meet with thee. This is God speaking to Moses. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. That's why it says here on, on the slide that the mercy seat is there. Yeah, the mercy seat is the covering, the lid of that box. The mercy seat from between the two cherubims. Yeah, we see it right there in the picture. Of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children. So I'm sorry, did I, I think I skipped, skipped something. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony. So the name of the whole ark is the ark of the testimony. Why? 
because the tables of the testimony were kept there. That is a very important point because the, the, the tables did not get the name from the box, the ark to the name of the tables because the tables are the important part of what is inside in the second compartment. It represents the throne of God. And so now we are going to continue back on page 156 onto the, the last paragraph. And here is Moses speaking, as it said before, letting them know, recounting to them, this is 40 years later, and so many of them had not been alive at that time, and he wanted to tell them the story again, remind those that had been there, and tell those that were there for the first time, so that they could know. It says, at that time, the Lord said unto me, hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood, and I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables. The first tables were broken. You could read about that in Exodus 32, I believe it is. I am not positive right now. Yeah, 32, yeah. In Exodus 32, you can read what happened with the first set of tables. And I made an ark of shittim wood and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and went up into the mount, having the two tables in my hand. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writings, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned to myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark, which I had made. And there they be, as the Lord commanded me. Deuteronomy 10, verses 1 to 5. The cover of this ark was called the mercy seat. This was of solid beaten gold, and upon each end of it, a part of the same piece of gold, there was a cherub with wings outstretched. Quote, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. After these directions, the Lord said, Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, which Moses did, as we have read. Quote, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Exodus 25, 7 to 22. God said he would speak to them from between the cherubim. So we read, the Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion and he is high above all people, Psalms 99, 1 and 2. The cherubim overshadowed the mercy seat from which place God spoke to the people. Now, mercy means grace, so that in, mercy, in the mercy seat of the earthly tabernacle, we have the figure of the throne of grace, unto which we are exhorted to come boldly, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It is time for us to close, and I would like us to close with the words of Hebrews 4.16, please. Hebrews 4.16, which indicates exactly what we'll, we will be doing next, which is uh, kneeling for prayer. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come how? Boldly. Boldly. The boldness is only because of Jesus Christ, right? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And when we think about it 
for a couple minutes or for a couple seconds, we realize that we are always in need, right? We always have need of him. Let us kneel for prayer then. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we bow before you with gratitude in our hearts because you have invited us to come boldly before the throne of grace, the great and awesome throne of the universe, where the God that created everything is awaiting us and who invites us to come before his presence just like children barge into the room where their parents are. We do not deserve any of your goodness and your kindnesses and your invitations, Lord. But the merits of Jesus, the merits of his blood have purchased both the privilege of prayer and the answers to all our questionings, our needs, everything that comes in our lives can be communicated to heaven and heaven delights in listening and answering to us. Thank you. Thank you so much for bestowing upon us so much grace, so much mercy. Help us to live lives that are grateful, not just by what we say with our lips, but how we live from day to day. May we show you our great gratitude, our real gratefulness for what you have done, you are doing, and you continue to do daily and prepare to do for us in the earth made new. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.